a bit more agile and the sort of um, implementation of an operational team inside of Atlassian for our Atlassian On Demand, our SaaS offering. But before I get on with that, who here has been watching the cricket? Yeah, excellent. Pretty dismal sort of effort by Australia, but um, hopefully we can pick it up in Hyderabad in a bit. So carrying on, I mentioned I am from Atlassian. So does anyone here actually use the Atlassian products day to day? Excellent. Pretty good showing. Yep, we got sort of the major ones, Confluence, Jira, Greenhopper, Fisheye, those guys, all available from um, our Atlassian On Demand offering. But I'm not going to um, sort of hype on too much about our products. I just want to tell you about the processes and changes we've made to sort of increase our efficiency in um, production. So before we go on, a little bit about me. Sorry, I might just move this mic. There we go. A little bit about me. I'm a development team lead at Atlassian, so we've got a small team of guys working on our Atlassian on-demand offering. That's our SaaS offering. We currently have about 26,000 customers on this platform that's about 18 months old, and we run about 70,000, just shy of 70,000 JVMs. So it's um, really cool. It's really high scale, which is something I really dig. Um, we built, well, my team built the current deployment infrastructure we use for that. So um, pushing new releases to production, and we really sort of in, um, sort of smooth that pipeline and increase the speed. We can push sort of new features to customers, and I'm always keen on improving the development pipeline. Also, my Twitter handle's there, so if anyone wants to follow my work account on Twitter. So the things I want to cover today: are operations at Atlassian, how we handle sort of ops. Granted, this platform we use for SaaS is only 18 months old. We did have a SaaS offering prior to that, but that was by a third-party vendor. So this is the sort of first time we've done it completely in-house. And we've had this operations team, relatively young, only 18 months old, so we're still learning. And I'll go over a few of the things we've learned um, from that. Our development cycle, how that's improved um, sort of in relation to the hosted aspect. Um, it used to be extremely brittle, and I'll, I'll go over it in more detail how it used to be, but um, sort of we've made a number of improvements there. How we actually handle, actually handle deployments. Um, I love talking about deployments. I love talking about pushing code out and getting these new features in front of customers. And um, I won't harp on too much about it today, but afterwards, if anyone wants to talk to me about it, I'm more than keen to. And of course, the feedback loop. And this is probably the most crucial part of it. It's taking what we learn during the deployment process and the development process and feeding that back into our um, teams, into our process, to sort of remove any of the friction there, to remove any of the sharp edges we have for um, actually getting these features out to customers. So I've mentioned Atlassian On Demand a little bit um, already. As I said, this is our SaaS offering, and it's basically making the Atlassian applications available as a service in the cloud. So your Jira, your Confluence, your um, Fisheye Crucible crowd, all available in the um, cloud. Does anyone here currently use an Atlassian on-demand instance for work? So you're the guys that use Atlassian host it themselves? OK. So um, what we do is a simply basic SaaS model. For a monthly charge, we provide the service. We look after it for you. We make sure it's always updated to the latest version. However, if you have ever administrated Atlassian applications, you will know they are large, monolithic, single tenanted Java applications. So we had some very unique challenges in shoehorning this into a, um, a SaaS offering. And if you've ever administrated Jira, you know it can take potentially 10 minutes to start the application. So there's, there's some unique challenges here for our deployments and upgrades in production there. So this is what it looks like. And we take these five applications, um, these five core Atlassian applications, and we push them to our cloud provider. Previously, this third party, it would take us three months from release of a product to get those features in front of a customer. Okay? Three months, that's 90 days. That is a long time, okay? Considering Atlassian follows the model of using 98-day release cycles. So every 98 days, we push a new big feature, um, a new big version of the product. That three months, that 90 days, if you consider our SaaS customers, they were perpetually almost a complete version behind what was currently the latest and greatest. The changes and sort of um, techniques I'll go over today and the feedback will show how we sort of reduce that from that three months down to six days. 
So we can cut a release of Jira or Confluence or any of those guys and have those new features in front of the customer, in front of 26,000 customers, in six days. And there is still a ton of room for improvement in there, okay? We, um, we I think in there we've got about three days soak time and testing on our internal instances, but um, we can definitely improve that. And it's definitely improvement over 90 days. So how do we handle operations at Atlassian? I mentioned earlier that um, the operations team is quite young. They're only 18 months old. And because of this, we've learned a few things. But let me just go over how we actually work there. The operations team at Atlassian is um, only seven people. Who here works in a company that has an operations team for um, production sort of systems? Yeah, 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 a few of you. Okay, so as you might know, there's some very unique challenges for the, the ops side of things. We've got seven people worldwide, and that's split up into three in Sydney, two in Amsterdam, and two in San Francisco. They're the three major Atlassian offices we have. And these guys are responsible for maintaining that 24-7 coverage of um, our platform. So they, uh, I think they called it a follow the sun methodology of just constantly, um, you know, during the daylight hours of whoever's region is, maintaining sort of um, uptime and incidents on that platform. These guys are also responsible for managing the, you know, nearly 70,000 JVMs we have running in production. That, that's only the production side of things, that 70,000 as well as all of our logging, monitoring, and deployment infrastructure that we have, and on top of that, any incidents. So as you know, with an operational team, the biggest thing is sort of responding to the incidents, maintaining your SLA, and keeping that uptime. Um, that's also part of their job. But these guys, they're very good. Like, been at Atlassian about 18 months, and they're extremely good at what they do. Three of the guys on the team are ex-developers turned sysadmins, sort of operational engineers. So there's no sort of harm there jumping into the code and um, sort of finding out what's wrong. These guys work very closely with our infrastructure teams and our development teams. We'll go over that soon. Sorry? Yeah, um, so the question was, is it 65,000 JVMs? And yes, it's actually a bit closer to 70,000 JVMs, and it's sort of increasing every single day as we sign up new customers. Sorry? Uh, we have 32 racks of equipment in a data center in um, Ashburn, um, I think that's in Virginia in the States. So 32 racks, and we have about 10 compute node, 10 diskless compute nodes per rack, so um, 320 compute nodes all virtualized across them. So we can, we can easily balance and shift customers and um, sort of do it for load. Um, I'll go over it in a moment, but it's a completely sort of in-house built and designed sort of private cloud platform. So very much like EC2, you can just spin up a um, virtualized instance, get access to it, and push latest releases of our software to it. Obviously, this one is tailored sort of explicitly to the Atlassian products so that um, we can get the best efficiency we can out of um, our hosting. So, well, I'll cover it now. <laughs> um, we have this cloud platform, this private cloud platform internally. And this hit team you can see here is our hosted infrastructure team. These are the guys responsible for designing and implementing this internal platform we have and also the bug fixes, maintenance and all that. And so they work very, they're well, tightly coupled to this platform, this team, work very closely with it. Sort of conversely, we have the product team, which sits on top of this, as well as that are hosted development teams. So these hosted development teams are generally engineers from all of the product teams that we have that work together um, to give it a specific sort of hosted twist, the um, SaaS style twist that we need for developers on these teams. And of course, the jam in the middle here is the hosted operations team. These guys are the ones that keep everything running when they break. So I mentioned earlier these three teams work very closely together, and that's true, um, that we do secondments, we do um, virtual teams, we do sort of sharing of resources, um, depending what the work is, to get things done. And the next point is um, something that is not necessarily unique to Atlassian, but it's something I absolutely love about them, is that no code base inside of Atlassian is off limits. So we do have code ownership by teams, but there's nothing stopping an operational guy come along, check out the JIRA code base, and send a pull request to fix something up to make it a little bit more efficient on the platform. One of our core values at Atlassian is sort of be the change you seek, and we really want to empower the guys to be able to go ahead and make the changes there that they need in production. Conversely, if there are changes that need to be made in the platform, we really push to allow the product developers and the, dev, the hosted dev guys to make those changes and get them in there. Then 
I know this, this, this may be a bit controversial, but um, nothing, nothing is better, well, I have not found anything better than the sitting close, the physical proximity to these guys. Our hosted infrastructure team, our hosted operations team, and our hosted development teams all sit in the same area. But that includes our product owners, our product managers, and the business unit owners for that. We're all very close together, and there's nothing that I've found yet that beats sitting close together. So we've learned a few things from this, and um, this first point may come as a surprise, but we really, you really should have an operations team. Does anyone here run production code, um, customer-facing production code, and not have an operational team? I've, I've certainly been in companies that have done that. You know, it's just a couple of devs are, are there. You know, you know, Joe Bloggs there. You, you know, if something breaks, make sure you go and fix it. So I've been in places with that, and in the last 18 months, we, we've only implemented this operational team in the last 18 months when we moved to this new cloud platform. So that is a definite plus for us, and it's you know, a definite learning point. The no code is off limits. Again, we want to empower the guys to make changes. We don't want to put up artificial barriers between the projects to stop people not only um, making the changes they need for production, but also to, to hinder cross-skilling and learning what the code bases do. That sort of leads on to the third point, which is to really enable the cross-skilling of developers. At Atlassian, you're not a Java developer, you're not a Python developer, you're not an operational engineer. You're just an engineer, and you can get picked up and moved around as resources to, to better sort of improve your skilling and as the projects dictate. So we have operational guys that work very closely with the development teams on secondments to build features, and that is a... Um, absolute bonus because it provides that operational perspective when you're developing code that you just can't really get if it's just, you know, developers locked away in a room by themselves. So let's talk about the development cycle. What I want to cover here is how it was in it with our previous sort of cloud provider, how it was, it was very um, siloed, very much, um, I'm sure you've heard the expression, just tossing it over the fence. That's how we were in this previous development cycle. We would have, as, as you generally do, a product development team build a release of the software. In our case here, it was the, the binary you get when you go to downloads.atlassian.com. It was the binary you get if you're going to host it yourself um, on your own hardware, on your own servers. So what we did then is, well, what these product teams did then is they tossed this binary over the fence, a, a WAR file, a web archive, if you're familiar with the Java terms, toss it over the fence to this hosted development team. And these were... These were sad guys. They weren't, they weren't having a good time because their role was to explode the archive, explode it out, run a series of patch files against this. I'm, I'm not kidding here. Run a series of patch files against it, compress the archive back up, and run it and see what broke. If something broke, they'd go through, manually fix it, regenerate the patch files for next time. Okay? You can imagine this process. It's extremely brittle. It's extremely slow. And it's extremely manual. Okay? It's not something that scales, and it's not something we can do quickly. And then to further make this worse, these guys then threw this release, this new hosted archive they developed, over the fence to deploy into production for these SaaS customers, which was done by a third party. I'll cover that in the deployment phase a bit more, but um, again, the problem here is there's no sort of feedback. It's very much, once it's out of their hands, there's no care, it's just, you know, do what it, do what it takes over there. Sure. Yes. So I'll bring this up again. So the question was, were the guys applying the patches in the center there part of Atlassian? Yes, they were. But um, they were situated very far away, or not, not very far, relatively far away in the building and um, in a completely different sort of reporting structure. The idea was that they, would, they just existed there to apply these patches and generate this new artifact. Um, in, the, sorry, in the new cycle, we actually um, got rid of that, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Yes, there, there was a definite effort, and that was part of the changes we made for this, was to push the responsibility for generating these on-demand specific artifacts back to the product team. Sorry, was there a question over here? Okay, sorry. So we went ahead and we improved this, and this is just a sort of quick diagram on how we improved that. The product team still maintain their own in, internal development loop, that inner development loop, you know, the build, test, QA sort of thing, that cycle. The advantage here was all of these stages in build, test, and QA 
we made available for them to be able to push those artifacts to our new cloud platform. That means that when you have a release, you say, um, say you're working on a feature branch of JIRA to add some new feature. You can then run the command to push that actual branch, so you haven't even released it yet, push that branch up to our um, infrastructure and see it running in our hosted infrastructure there. So there was a really good saving there, and we sort of really integrated with the, the hosted aspect of it from day dot. Then we have the hosted development and the operational teams were brought in from the very start. And once we have some sort of release, and these are generally done nightly or sometimes, depending on the product team, up to every single commit, um, we push to our dog food environments. Does anyone know what I mean by dog fooding? Okay, yeah, I was worried this wouldn't um, sort of translate properly. <laughs> okay, so um, it follows the concept of eating your own dog food. Does anyone? Yeah, I see, I see a few nods. Okay, so Atlassian is extremely big on eating your own dog food. And what that means is using our products that we build um, really in anger so that we're hopefully the first ones to find out what issues we have there. If we have issues operating a feature or, you know, how something looks or the usability of the product or finding bugs, if we can't operate it correctly, how can we expect our customers to be able to do it when us as the developers can't even do it? So what we have internally to Atlassian, we have a number of dog fooding instances, and these are, for all intents and purposes, production systems, because marketing use them, HR use them, finance, all the non-technical teams rely on these instances to be up every single day. So the way it does, generally works is every night on a nightly green build, we'll push these deployments out to all of our dog fooding instances. We have some product teams that are able to do it a lot quicker, such as the Confluence team. They can deploy um, a new release of the product, a snapshot release of the product for every single commit and do it without any downtime um, in, for the customers. But um, they're probably the most advanced along here. The remainder of the deployment cycle, sorry, the development cycle, is um, sort of the standard with anything if you're pushing it out to production. We go through our staging, we go through our canarying, and we go th out to production. But at every stage, these are closely tracked by our hosted development team and actually run by our hosted operations team, as well with the integration from those product team guys. Yeah? Yeah, sorry, let me... Too far. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah, it's coming. So the idea here with the test and QA was we um, build in the pushing it to our hosted platform a lot sooner. The issue before was um, with testing and QA was that we couldn't actually test in the production environment. We couldn't test in an environment that was even remotely similar to what it was going to be like in production. So um, if you remember the first slide where we had this third party um, hosted provider out on the side, um, it was up to them. They were the ones maintaining all the hardware, the infrastructure, the, the everything set up there. We couldn't actually push out there for our um, offer feature branch or anything like that. We could get releases out there a lot well, um, we could get dog food releases out there, but it was a much slower process, and I'll cover that in the, the deployment side of things. But the difference here was that during our testing and QA, everything is actually done on the infrastructure that production runs. We have a special, we, we call them zones. We have a special zone dedicated for test, test instances that we can spin up and down at, at will and push feature branches or push issues or just push a particular hash of um, the product out to that so we can test it. And then of course we have all our um, automated testing and you know, sort of all our CI stuff pointed at these instances out in um, our hosted infrastructure. Okay, so, um, sorry, th these are sort of terms we use inside. The, diff the question is, what's the difference between testing and QA? Uh, testing's really our um, automated testing, our um, unit test, functional testing, acceptance testing, those sorts of things that we've been able to automate or written um, as part of the feature. The, the QA side of things is, again, um, almost... Probably on the, on the manual side of things, it's the validation of the feature. Um, we use a technique called DOT, which is developer on test, which um, we, we have QA engineers, but all their role is is to um, sort of advise how we can best um, utilize and best do QA. And then that we have different developers that go through and actually do the QA of features. So the number of things we learned from actually changing our development cycle were 
eating your own dog food. I know it's not possible in a lot of places, but if it is, if you're, you work in a place where it's possible to eat your own dog food, you should definitely go ahead and do that. This is sort of the, apart from all our automated testing, it's excellent for usability testing and having people actually use the features you're writing before it gets to in front of the customer, okay? So you can actually find these things out a lot sooner. The feedback, the feedback's extremely important and I've got a whole section dedicated to the techniques we use for feedback, but we need to get that back to the development teams, to the product managers, to the product owners as soon as possible because we always want to fail fast, okay? We don't want to go through the entire cycle to the end, get a feature out to production and find issues with it so that, well, the last thing we want is for a customer to find issues with it and report it through support. We want to be able to find these as soon as possible and then fix them up before they even get in front of a customer. So how do we handle our deployments at Atlassian? Well, there are a number of things. This is how we used to do it, um, and it literally was, well, not literally, it was a can of worms, okay? All of this was handed off to this third party to handle deployments for us, and all of the feedback only came when something broke, and again, that was at the end of the cycle, okay? There was no developer involvement at all for any of these deployments. It was done by this third party. It was literally posting them off the artifact and getting them to deploy it. It's an extremely manual process they used. I don't know if you've ever deployed things at a large scale, but um, the last thing you want is a manual process. You want an automated process you can easily repeat. Um, and because of that, in this case, well, in this old system we had, it would take five days to deploy to 3,000 instances. So 3,000 customers, it took five days. You know, if you, if you extrapolate that out to where we are today with 26,000 active customers, um, I think it works out, it's about 40 days it equals to if it scales linearly, which I doubt it does. We contrast that to how we currently do deployments, and we can deploy to our 26,000 instances in two and a half hours. So that's pushing new versions of all of the applications. So with this, at, um, these deployments that required us to come up with a plan, okay? We had this completely new platform and we were going to start taking over all of these deployments, so bringing everything in-house, okay? So for that, we had to come up and define a new process for how we're actually going to do deployments. So the first thing um, that is paramount is automating your releases. Who here does not have a pro... Or, yeah, does have an automated release process. Who here does not have um, a process where they can just click a single button and cut a new release of their software? Like I know, again, I've definitely worked in places like that. I've definitely worked in places where there was a single person who knew the magic incantations and you know, if they were on leave or something, he couldn't release the software. And again, that's something that just doesn't pass the bus test. Um, sorry, do I understand what I mean by the bus test? Blank faces, yes, no? Yeah, you do? Okay, I get one, yes. Anyway, the, the bus test basically means if, um, if this fella, it's a bit gruesome, if this person is hit by a bus on the way to work, can you still function? Okay, and with a single person managing releases and knowing all these magical incantations, you can't really say you passed the bus test. So automating the releases is a big thing. Atlassian has been huge in automating their, all of their releases um, for behind the firewall software, for the stuff you download, but um, not for our hosted stuff. So what we did is went through the process. We, I think the question was earlier about um, the patch files and things. We actually pulled that responsibility from that hosted development team. They were no longer responsible for patching releases. What they would do is hand all that code we had, all these patch files, off to the development team and told the development teams, it's now your responsibility to produce us an artifact that works in on-demand. Not too much pushback on that because On Demand was a big growing platform, a big um, advantage for these um, product teams. So they were pretty cool about that. It um, also meant that all of these changes for On Demand get into their unit tests and acceptance tests, all that, they run against it on every commit. So we were able to fail a lot faster and find out what was wrong um, on these builds as they were going. So first one's automate the releases. The second one is automate the deployments. So, again, a bit trickier, but we had a huge advantage in that we had just built this internal platform and had complete ownership over how our deployments worked. 
I know, again, I've worked in places, if you've got a manual release process, you've probably got a manual deployment process. So um, what we've done for both release and deployments is hooked it up to um, Bamboo, our CI server, but you know, it doesn't really matter what you use. We use Bamboo because we eat our own dog food. You can hook it up to Team City um, Jenkins, or it doesn't even have to be that, as long as you've got a repeatable process there to be able to do this. So automating the deployments, fantastic. Um, just make sure we've got something we can repeat. The third one we started doing, and again, this is more for um, when our process was starting out. As our process matured a bit, we could actually drop this restriction and use um, a wiki page or something like that. But it was having a pre-deployment stand up. When we have sort of five products changing in a release, so at the moment we release every single Monday to production, um, if we have five products changing in that, that's potentially quite a lot of feature changes or changes that are coming in. So what we require is guys, um, the stakeholders for those feature changes, to come down and have a stand up with our operational guys to say, you know, these are the new features going in, these are the potential risks with those features, these are the failure modes of it, and this is how we sort of roll it back. And what we do is we go around and then we have a, an, a coordinator for the release who then goes through um, just, you know, if we do fail, this is how much time we're giving you to fix it, this is the remainder of the window, and this is how we're rolling back. So um, they're, they're an excellent technique for when we're, excuse me, getting started here. And then, of course, when you do the actual deployment, we absolutely require the stakeholders to be present. This is not negotiable for us. Um, and we took this from a document that was written about uh, the Facebook deployment process. I don't know if anyone's read about that, but basically what it said was when Facebook are deploying to production, everyone needs to be in this chat room to um, be there to support your feature when it goes there. If you're not available in the chat room, your change sets don't get merged into the release branch and your features don't go out to production. So unfortunately, we can't take um, such a stand on that, given the, the nature of our sort of monolithic applications. But um, so we just require the guys to be present there so that if something does fail, we can easily um, sort of recover from that or at least go forward. Or we have someone there that knows what the issue is with it. And the last thing we started doing was that once all of this is complete, we come up with a, just a post-deployment report card. So how the deployment went for each product. And you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be the simplest thing in the world. We use just a wiki page, a few details about the deployment, and we just give it a red, green, um, yellow for how the deployment went for each product. You can see there, um, we have three greens, and Jira was the only product with one, which had a, a JVM startup bug for 14 instances, and a link to the issue. And just the issue says, you know, um, we encountered this again. And this is another mechanism we use for feeding back those info into the product teams so that um, they can know where to help us reduce the friction in our deployment process. So this leads on nicely to our feedback loop. Yes? So um, the question was, when I say release our deployment or, um, sorry, automate our release or deployment, was there any specific tool that we use? Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so um, for our releases, we use Bamboo internally. Um, a lot of our projects are Maven projects, and we, it's simply a shim around running the unit test and then running a Maven release, prepare, release, perform, if you're familiar with that. Um, but it really doesn't matter on the tool you use for that, as long as you have some automated route repeatable and reproducible sort of way of doing it. Prior to that, if we don't have a build set up, we actually have a server we call BuildBox, which has a known build environment, which we can go in and generally for smaller projects, manually run a release on it on this, under this known configuration. Because there have been a number of instances where we have had unknown configurations or someone's you know, manually tweaked their Maven repo on their local dev machine and then run a release with it and you get these weird artifacts packaged up. So you know, they, they are incredibly hard to diagnose. So um, it's great to have this because it, you know, you're just wasting time there trying to diagnose these issues. In terms of deployments, um, I think our situation was reasonably unique in that we had to deploy to this um, very custom infrastructure for our products. We analyze things like Fabric, Capistrano, and Collective and Puppet, um, Rundeck, all those, those sorts of things, but none of them really fit our bill. We actually built an internal tool for that. And um, you know, I, I'm always keen to talk about that, but I'll, I won't cover it in this presentation, but afterwards over a coffee or a beer, I'm more than happy to go into all the details with you. Does that answer the question? Excellent, thank you. Excuse me. Okay, I'm gonna pick it up a bit because I'm, I'm afraid I'm gonna go over time. So the feedback loop. Why do we wanna have a feedback loop? Okay, why do we wanna provide feedback? Now I think, 
the number one reason we want to provide feedback is to avoid repeating mistakes we've made in the past. Okay? It's, it's perfectly fine to make a mistake. Okay? Making mistakes is human, yet we do it. The problem occurs when we start making that same mistake two, three, four times. Okay? We don't want to repeat those. We want to try and stop repeating those mistakes. Obviously, the feedback is going to help us improve the current process. Any friction along the way, we want to sort of you know, remove. We want to polish the sharp edges. We want to sort of sand those down so we can get the smoothest process. We want to take the least amount of time for a developer completing a feature to getting that feature in front of customers. Obviously, I've said this a few times tonight, we want to fail fast. If we don't have that feedback loop in place, how can we fail fast? If we don't know about, about it, how can we fix it? And then all of this is in the name of shipping quality features faster. As I said earlier, we want to reduce the time it takes to get it completed and out into production in front of customers. So how do we go about doing this? Well, there's a whole bunch of different techniques, and I like to break them into three categories. So we have the during our iteration, how we actually get feedback there, our real-time feedback, and then after our iteration, once the iteration's complete. So during it, we have a whole bunch of different techniques. You know, there's tons of them. These are just a few we use at Atlassian. Obviously, our CI build, so unit tests, um, acceptance tests, functional tests, all those sorts of things, um, providing us heaps of amount of feedback during our development cycle. Dog fooding, huge. Like, we don't wait to cut a release to push it to dog food. We continuously push to dog food so that they're always seeing the latest and greatest. We also have a, a sort of policy on that is all our releases are cut off master. So um, if you use Git or master, default, trunk, it's, it's all the same. All our releases are cut off that. So you know, we nightly push master to um, all our dog food servers. Obviously issues, pull requests, and daily stand-ups, another great ways of sort of pulling that feedback in. Obviously, real-time stuff is that what we actually get um, in day-to-day -day when events are happening. Information radiators, anyone familiar with the term? It's, yeah, awesome, awesome, two of them. That's good. It's basically, it's a flashy term for dashboards, okay? Have dashboards around your workplace. Um, you know, information radiator is much like a, a radiator heater. It sort of radiates that information out to everyone that passes. Um, obviously, all the synchronous um, chat mechanisms, IMIRC, HipChat, really great for um, pushing this feedback in. Um, we've hooked up a lot of our automated stuff, our monitoring and learning that. It's hooked into our IRC, IM, and HipChat rooms so that when anything happens, you get about 50 notifications if something's bad's happening. But um, you know, that, that's excellent there. I mentioned alerting and monitoring, and of course, analytics. Really good for um, seeing what the uptake is in features. Is a feature working? Is it not? If there's a sudden decline in that feature usage, is there a problem there? worth investigation. Just on the information radiators, we have a whole bunch of um, these around Atlassian. I think on my floor we have about 20 or 30 of these TVs. There's, there's just heaps of them. And every couple of desks you'll see this TV with different information on it relevant to that team. We can see here this is um, a support dashboard. You probably can't see it, but um, it's a support dashboard, trust me. Got other ones. This is our, um, a dashboard from our deployment tooling. We can see here, um, you can see the numbers up the top. They add up to about 20,000 instances. That's, um, we're running a deployment out to production. And then, of course, you've got your typical things like your burn down charts and all that, more specifically for the development teams. And of course, after the iteration, we have, again, the standard mechanisms, issues, bugs, support cases, those sorts of things that are getting raised from external parties. Our daily stand-ups and our pre-deployment stand-ups, and then of course those deployment report cards we have. So I just want to reiterate what I said earlier. Like the sooner we know about a bug or a potential issue, like the sooner we can fix it. If we don't, like it's, it's very simple. You know, I think everyone will agree with me here. That, that that's extremely simple. But if we don't know about an issue, how can we be expected to fix it? So part of this feedback loop and the whole fail fast idea is that we get that information back to the developers and the product managers as soon as possible so that it can be fixed before it goes in front of the customers. I did have a story, but um, yeah, I think I'm running over time. So during coffee, um, I'm happy to tell this story. It's just a little anecdotal story where we didn't follow our process exactly and we ended up conducting a DDoS on both GitHub and Bitbucket. Um, awesome times. But I'm happy to talk about that about anyone. So the key things I'd like to cover off in this one were that, you know, eat your own dog food. It's extremely important, if you can, to use the software you produce. Like, if you don't have an understanding of the software, how can you expect the customers to be able to? 
The no code is off limits. Again, I know it's going to be dependent on the organization you work in, but if you can start breaking down those barriers between the teams and encourage the cross-skilling and the sort of, I guess, fixing what you need and being the change you really seek inside the organization, then you know, that is an absolute huge advantage. Avoid repeating mistakes. You know, I'm, I think everyone's going to be with me here. You, know, you don't want to repeat the same mistake over and over again. Once is fine, let's not let it happen twice. Obviously, fail fast. Again, we, can't, um, we don't want to see a feature all the way out to in front of the customer before we find out some critical issue with it. And you know, it happens all the time. It happens with us constantly. Like, um, well, not constantly, but it, it does happen with us as well. And of course, that feedback is sort of imperative to, to getting that fail fast and that the sort of reducing the friction in deploying to production. So all of these things, you know, they're beta. They're like um, a Google app. They're in perpetual beta. All of this we're trying to improve and all of this we're always looking at um, how we can improve it, how we can make it better. And so th these are just some of the things that helped us along the way. And, you know, I'm really keen to talk to all of you guys to see, you know, what techniques you, you guys have used and how you guys have improved your process and, you know, learn from each other. So thank you very much today. And um, also I put a plug in. We're also hiring if anyone's interested. <laughs> Cheers, guys.